Everyone, please stay if you can. We have a wonderful, wonderful uh, interview coming up with Catherine and Ernie. But first, we would like to make an award, the first ever Breakout Director Award is going to Catherine Bainbridge. And we had a very extraordinary selection committee, and I would like to introduce them now. We had Jason Weinberg, come on out guys. Jason Weinberg, Sean Sachs, Carter Burden, and Roger Sherman, who isn't here, but come over, come over a little bit. The, we had several extraordinary films to pick from, and this committee picked Rumble. And so, um, Jason, it was, this was Jason, Jason Weinberg's brainchild. He's the co-founder of Untitled Entertainment. He's going to present the award to Catherine, and he's also an advisory board member of the Hamptons Take Two Documentary Film Festival. So, Jason. Thank you very much. You're on. All right. <clears throat> well, our first ever Breakout Director Award is being given in recognition of an original and exceptional first or second feature length film, which has resonated with both the industry and the public. And on behalf of the jury, uh, we are thrilled to present the award to director producer Catherine Bainbridge for her film, Rumble, The Indians Who Rocked the World. Thank you so much. I don't have much to say except that at 56 years of age, it's wonderful to know that you can get a, a breakout director award <laughs> and that we can still be making great things no matter what age we are. I'm so proud to be at this festival. I'm so grateful to everybody. Thank you so much. Honestly, like the, um, the films I've seen here, are truly some of the best films that are being made right now. Not because we are, but the other ones we've seen are so great. And I just want to thank so much the selection committee and the director, uh, the, 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 um, the board of directors, um, and all of you for coming. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. We made it with love for everybody. Thank you very, 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 very much. We, we do want to give you a chance to ask some questions, but I just want to talk to uh, Catherine and Ernest first. Um, thank you very much for this film. Uh, it's just, it, it just feels so incredibly important um, uh, as a film to be made. Uh, it's so, I mean, not only in music, but in every, in every uh, part of our culture today, the Native Americans are so overlooked and so it's, it's, it's despicable and unspeakable, but the, to have singled this out, this musical influences and, and how that goes. It's just such a valuable history lesson um, for our culture, and not just pop culture, which winds up being at the end more pop culture. But this, this goes all the way back to the land, and I think the the beauty of the film um, is that it keeps coming back to the land. Uh, visually, we keep going back to the land, which is the source of it all, and that, that that's that's the lesson in the beginning, and then continues on through it. Um, so, how did you get onto this film uh, in the first place? Very briefly, because um, it, it was um, uh, um, there, this, the, the Apache guitarist, Stevie Salas, the one who was like, you know, sleeping with all the women and like, you know, whatever, him, him, he had this idea early on. He was like, wow, I can't be the only Native American involved in this. And he started clocking all the Native Americans in film. And then he met, when he was at the Six Nations uh, Reserve, which is Mohawk, um, he met a man named Tim Johnson, who is the programming director of the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian in Washington. And those two got together, and we call, it, call them the, the scoundrel and the scholar, you know, got together and conceived an, of an exhibit for the Smithsonian in Washington to talk about the indigenous influence on music. And, you know, everyone at the Smithsonian was poo-pooing it, you know, they did mostly artifacts and stuff about pottery. And all of a sudden, they, you know, they, 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 they suggested this, this, this exhibit and they gave them just a wee bit of money and they made this exhibit and it had lineups around the block. 
okay, admittedly, it was all Randy Castillo heavy metal fans, but anyway. <laughs> but it was super, it was the most popular exhibit that the Smithsonian had ever done. So then they did it in New York at the Smithsonian. And they realized, oh, geez, we're onto something. And so those two guys came to us to say, I think we should make a documentary about it. Because of Real Engine. Yeah, we made a movie before called Real Engine. If you ever get a chance to watch it, I think it's on YouTube or all those, whatever, all those things everywhere you can, or just steal it, you know. <laughs> um, it, it's about the image of Native Americans in Hollywood film. And it's really funny and done with love. Because that's why they came to us, is we do everything with love. We're not into doing things, because uh, we're not going to get anywhere with anger. We can only get places with love. And music is one of those things that can take you somewhere. So when they asked us, do you want to make this movie? We said, we absolutely do, because it's rare that you get a chance to cross over. We, we've been making Native American films for 25 years. And um, it's, it's rare you get to cross over and make something that people care about. So Hollywood movies was the way we did it in Real Engine, and music is a way you can do it too. You know, you can, you can touch people's hearts and talk about difficult subjects and no one needs to feel guilty. They can just open their heart up and just really be open and discuss it, so. Well, and it's, it, it's tremendously emotional anyway because, I mean, I was, I was crying but, but lots of different elements of the film, of the people, the incredible amount of talent and the incredible amount of difficulties that people had to go through to get to this point. Um, it was really phenomenal. Now, uh, Stevie was a producer on the film. He's exec one of the executive producers right, and an in integral place. part of the film. And so when he got together with John Trudell and they went to Indian land, um, that was because of the film that they connected? Uh, well, yeah, but they were connected before. Indian country's small. You know, people know each other. And so they were connected already, but they definitely connected for the film, absolutely. John Trudell was in the last stages of cancer. At the time you see him in the movie, he's one of the greatest poets uh, in Indigenous America. He's like uh, an awesome poet and a scholar and a, an activist. And um, so we had one of the last interviews with him, and that's why the film is dedicated to him. He's one of those people who, I remember early on, he said, um, when we were in Real Engine, we were like, why do pe white people always want to wear feathers and you know, like, you know, headbands and all that? And I went to a girls' camp, like a, you know, like I think you have them in the Northeast, a girls' camp where our, our British, um, the head of the camp, she's British, she wore a headband and a fake wig and like, a, you know, whatever. I was like, <laughs> It was our girls' camp. And Eugenie Asta. Eugenie Asta, she called herself. It's like so embarrassing. <laughs> and we're like all white people there. But like John Trudell said, he goes, look, everyone once wore feathers. Everyone once wore beads. We have to understand our commonality and our love. And he came from that kind of place. He's a very profound person. And um, we were really uh, uh, honored to be with him on that trip with Stevie. Well, but he was a bit of a rock star too, eh, John Trudell? He was a bit of a rock star too, you know? So. And, uh, and that album, I, I just got to get that album that, what, that he made it with Jesse Ed Davis. Uh, that sounded so good and so powerful. Um, people love Jeff Ed, Jesse Ed Davis. Oh, yeah, of a lot of people just love him, you know? He's a brilliant musician, yeah. No, well, they're all, they're all brilliant in their own way, and they have such great humanity and personalities to them, and uh, they're just really beautiful. Um, so when, when you started to make this, did the people that you say Indian country small, did a lot of these musicians already know each other that we see through the film? I mean, that they, they constantly are referring to each other and so forth, and when you went to them for the interviews, I mean, how did you set that up to, to contact the different people, to, re to weigh in on the different Indians in, in the music? Um, well, Stevie knew a lot of those, like the big rock stars already, but you know, when you talk about six degrees of separation in Indian country, it's like three degrees of separation. And when, whenever we did a, um, um, an interview, like say someone with, um, the guy from, um, uh, yeah. like, like they would, um, they would say, okay, these guys are cool, you know, so you can talk to them. You, right. can, uh, you can let them in and have, do the interview with you. And so that, that was, Stevie opened the doors for us with the big rock stars and stuff. I would say there's two souls to the film. One is Stevie, who got us in with the rock stars, like Slash and Iggy Pop and, you know, all those guys, you know. And the other soul to the film is Pura Fey, the indigenous woman who played the, you know, yeah. the record and like, 
you know, so that indigenous women, because women, women, you know, like we've not been rock stars for a long time, right? We're always like supporting our rock star guys and whatever, you know, that's what we do. And so, and so the women, except for Mildred Bailey, wasn't she awesome? The jazz woman, she's so, and, and of course, Buffy St. Marie. She's tough as shit, that girl. So, you know, and, and survived our survivance. But, um, but mostly women, you know, we, 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 we port culture. We, 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 we help carry culture. And we support our men. We support our societies. We help port culture. And um, so the women, we had to weave them in in a certain way because they weren't known as, as whatever. And Perifei represents that. Well, She's the, the porter of culture. And so the two souls of the film, I would say in terms of storytelling, was, was Stevie getting us into the rock star realm so that it would be relevant to everybody so kids would watch it so they would be proud of it you know and know that there was real influence not just like oh yes we influenced you know all of music like you know some random nobody saying that you need rock stars to say it well, in a way like I don't know if you noticed but because it gave it weight we, we, we stacked the beginning of the film with rock stars so y'all would believe it <laughs> No, but it's not right. It's and then you get the and then you get the woman and the and the and the grassroots people telling you it's also true. You know what I mean? Because we're we're a bit hardwired that way. We're always told all kinds of things in this information age. So we wanted to stack it at the beginning that you believe it, and then you'd really listen. So so the other soul of the film is is, is Perfei. That 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 she's the one. What really, honestly, uh, those two are the are the 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 heart and soul of what of what we were listening to when we when we did the film. And the music that they made together, the women made together, was so beautiful and so clearly connected to the other music that we've heard. But the other point that was made it was made in the film uh, that I was not as, as aware of as I might have been, a lot of it, um, was talking about the uh, men being moved away and then the Africans being brought over. And there's no Who knew? Men, and Who so, knew? And so everyone tracing their Native American heritage back to their grandmother on their mother's side. And when you look at the pictures, you just go... Wow, okay. Yes, for, for me, that was the big um, revelation as well, too, that 40% of the slaves were Native American. And when we debuted at, uh, when we premiered at uh, Sundance, there were black people who said, you helped connect the family lore to what I've been told. You know, you helped close that story for me. Thank you very much. And so whenever I hear somebody say, my great-grandmother was, I don't sneer at that anymore, right. you know? Right. So I, I take it into consideration and, and think about it a little bit more than just dismissing it. Yeah, because there was a thing in Native American society to dismiss my great-grandmother was a Cherokee princess kind of thing. Like, everyone was related to Native American. But hey, we really are all brothers and sisters in the end. That's, that's the truth yeah, of that that's matter. absolutely true. Absolutely true. And to the point you made about the beginning of the film, where you were stacking the deck with rock stars and so forth, but you could see that the Rolling Stones bring Howlin' Wolf to Europe, and then uh, Taj Mahal gets brought over for the rock and roll service, circus. But then Buddy Guy says, okay, the blues wasn't played in America because it's not right, because it's black music, so it's no good. So it took the British invasion to bring American music back to America and make it acceptable, that's because it, now it's okay, because it, white guys are doing it, it, so it's that's good, it, it's great. That's it. So just really amazing the way that you connected so many dots, uh, and just and a, and a beautiful and really beautiful and really, really important film. So um, I know uh, people want to ask questions, and you want to have, have some questions, so anybody, right there in the middle. I have a comment and a question. The comment is all you had to do to make me believe was to play the music. That's all it took. And the question is, when will it be available on DVD? So DVD's an issue. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone now is all downloadable. So it's we're on Amazon Prime, we're on YouTube, we're on, you can download it um, in all those ways. We're pirated too. We're, and, we're, and thank goodness we're pirated. Get your, get your children and grandchildren to get it for you. <laughs> we're okay with that. So um, where, where you can, if you search it, there's a lot of places to buy it. I think it's like, I don't know, it must be $10 or $9, I don't know. Um, our distributors are from New York. They're Kino Lorber. We're Canadian. We're not that good at business. And we have like, we have Because we're from a socialist country. Yeah. <laughs> 
but we're really happy to connect with business. You know what I mean? It's good for us. We're happy about it. Um, so they have it all arranged. There's places you can get it. But uh, DVDs, I guess they're not doing it. I, I guess they don't we're find... We're not there yet. But they don't find a business way of, of thing of it, unfortunately. There's the, the, the distribution of DVDs is not... I want a DVD too. But like, like digital, downloadable, or watching it on Amazon Prime. It's going to be on PBS. Um, yeah, it's on it's, HBO it's now. On, it's going to—it's on HBO in Canada. It's going to be on PBS in the States. It's on Amazon Prime here. Um, it's in Arte Germany in France. It's—it's uh, it's in Japan. It's in—I like, don't know wherever. It's like—it's—it's it's going places. But um, yeah, DVDs. I think unfortunately, it's a real drag because I, I like a DVD too, but it's not a thing anymore. Yes, talk to your grandchildren. That's it. Talk to your grandchildren. Just they will Google it and they will find it. On the business front, just a quick question. At the beginning, it said Seminole Hard Rock. What's that mean? Um, the Seminoles are the uh, uh, tribe from in the Florida region. They own all the hard rocks in the world, all the hard rock cafes and all the hard rock hotels in the world. They are an amazing business enterprise. They have done so well in business, and they are one of the main supporters of our film, and we're so grateful to them. And they came on board as well. Um, we are, um, well, we just, I don't know. We, we went for an Oscar campaign. We were, we were long listed for the Oscars. So we'll see if we get short listed as of Monday. And the Oneida Indians came on to help with that. But, um, you know, we, and the Chickasaw as well came on for that. Um, the Chickasaw Indians of Oklahoma. And um, I just have to say, well, whether we do or not, who knows? That's a whole other game. It was always complex. Us socialist Canadians, we didn't even know. It was like, what? What? What do we do? What do we do? What? Okay. What? Are we there? What? What do we do? Okay. You know, we really didn't. We weren't. We weren't. You know, really uh, on board with it, uh, properly. But we tried our best. Um, but all the Indians came on board in, in the sense of uh, they're behind the film. And you can imagine for Indigenous youth what that'll do to see a film like that, to know of their history and who they are, but also for white people and black people and all brown people and all people, like the foundations of America are not really known, uh, they're not the stories we were told. There's more, we have to go back and look and we can re retell our stories to ourselves so we can have a better future. Like our foundations were not um, properly discussed and if we can c continue to discuss them and, 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 be, and be loving and honest about them, we will have a better future. So that's how we feel about it. Um, so, uh, yeah. So anyway, the Indians are on, and, it's, and they're going to help us distribute it everywhere, as well as our New York awesome business distributors. Cool. Right here. Uh, I was curious about the Native American languages. And I know the gentleman spoke um, in a Cree. Can you speak about, uh, is the languages being preserved and are they being taught to uh, children uh, of the reservations or elsewhere? I think it depends on where you are uh, in terms of preserving the nat native languages. Um, I know in our case, where I'm from, the children are taught until grade three in the native language and then the other languages, French and English, are introduced. Uh, we also have a, um, a video game company, and we um, we developed a native. We develop. We develop. We developed a uh, Cree language uh, video game as well too. And so it all depends on where you are. Um, there's uh, different family languages too. And so where I'm from, the Cree language, we're from the Algonquin family language. We're from the Proto-Algonquins. And so wherever I go and I see a native place name, and especially if it's from the Algonquin family, I say, I pronounce it to myself in my head and play with it and see if I can catch the, the meaning of it. And I think uh, it, it all depends on where you are and how, how far the colonization and the eradication has gone. 
Like in Canada, there's 54 native languages, of which three are expected to survive this century, uh, Cree, Mohawk, and Inuit. But in Canada, like, um, like in the United States, the most uh, remarkable uh, movement in the mainstream is Black Lives Matter. In Canada, the most remarkable movement in the mainstream is Idle No More, which is an indigenous uh, movement. So we have proportionally way more indigenous people, and the up, the up, the rising up, and the awesomeness that's happening in the United States is also happening in Canada. And so they've changed that outlook now with a better outlook for indigenous language surviving by virtue of the people um, trying to make them survive. So now they're saying 10 out of 54. But there's, um, uh, you know, the, the, the future isn't set. We don't know where the future is. But um, I, I heard a really interesting statistic the other day, which is that in the United States, African Americans and indigenous people as well as in Canada, indigenous people see the future as brighter than ever before. Brighter than ever before. But also that the racism will be stronger than ever before, which makes sense. When you open up these questions, people are gonna react badly for a while. Things are gonna get worse before they get better. But the people are like rising up and white people are like, on a downturn, they're anxious, they're worried, they're scared, things are gonna be taken away from them, they're worried. That's why these discussions are super important, you know what I mean? But I, I found that interesting, just as a statistic coming up. So um, I don't know any more meaning to it than that, it's, it's just putting it out to you that that's what's happening. Uh, Jessica, gentlemen over here, Stony Brook University, does have the Algonquin language. It's, I think it's only about six weeks long, though. It's not a full And our cultural center teaches the, the kids with Algonquin language. Well, I have friends on the reservation, but I've never asked them about that language. Now, did you understand what the gentleman said? No, I did not. Because I'm from the old school, I was taught American English. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know too much of that. But I'd like to thank you for the movie. It was really great. And really, you educated everybody who's in the 70s who <laughs> did enjoy the music back then. And we didn't know then, or we weren't allowed to know then, who was who in the band. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the aspect of I just want to say this from the Shinnecock Nation here, like uh, right here, we're re re representing here and we're so honored that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. That aspect of the film was really, really tough to take, which was not wanting to identify, uh, be proud that you're an Indian, but don't tell, be careful who you tell. And uh, because of the situation, the, the three uh, bathrooms, and, and, and some people would rather be a Mexican than an Indian, and some people would rather be an Indian than a Mexican, depending on where you were. Mm -hmm. And then some places you wouldn't, didn't want to be either, but you were stuck with it. So it's just really, really remarkable. We have other questions? Can I ask the last question? Oh, okay, right up here. Uh, just the term uh, Indian and First Nations. I know in Canada you're using First Nations, and uh, I just want to know how you feel about that. Every indigenous nation, every first nation, every Indian nation calls themselves EU. And you can translate that into human. We are all human. I think in the States, like, I don't know, like, I think you have to check, check out with everybody. It's a discussion going on, you know, how you want to say things. Toronto, yeah. First yeah, First Nations, Indigenous. You won't do wrong with Indigenous. You won't do wrong with Indigenous. You won't do wrong with First Nations. You won't do wrong, like, uh, some people, Native American, they don't like. Like, I don't know. Um, Indian, you got to be in. 
<laughs> got to be in to say that. Thank you so, so much for... It's because she's married to me. That's why, that's why I can say it. 